Welcome to the Women in Vinyl podcast with Jen DiEugenio, founder of Women in Vinyl and contributor Robin Raymond. This podcast facilitates conversations with those working in the vinyl record industry to educate, demystify, and diversify the vinyl community. Thanks to Liv Mueller for this incredible song. Thank you for listening to the Women in Vinyl podcast. This episode, we're talking to Karen Kelleher, founder and president of Gold Rush Vinyl, a record pressing plant in Austin, Texas, named one of the most innovative companies of 2020 by Fast Company. Thanks for joining us, Karen. Oh, it's always so nice to connect with you. Yeah, yeah thanks, Karen. We're glad to have you. You've been a hot commodity these days. Yeah. (laughs) Hard to pin you down. Stop it. You flatter me. Oh, I will keep it coming. Trust me. This whole time. This whole time. (laughs) So how about a little background for those that don't know you? How did you get started? What is your background? I actually um, was just a huge music fan as a kid. I think like a lot of people that get into the music industry was the one making mixtapes and mixed CDs at the time for people and um, just always loved music. Didn't have a ton of talent for it myself, but knew I wanted to work in the music industry and ended up getting an amazing job right out of college working at Paste Magazine, running their marketing. And it exposed me to so much of what was going on in the music industry. Um, a few years later, and at Silicon Valley, more recently, was working at Google Play as the head of music partnerships there um, and helping mobile app developers like Spotify and Pandora be more successful on mobile. And during that time, my sister and I still um, had a, a hobby managing bands. We were managing some really great independent artists. And from that work and my work in Silicon Valley, I was starting to see the realities of what the digital music era was doing to musicians how little money there was being made on royalties, how hard it was to compete. And at the same time, how much vinyl was having a resurgence. You know, you'd be working at the merch table and kids would come up and just ask for vinyl and be like your 16 year old kid, like, (laughs) do you want vinyl? Like, do you want a record player? (laughs) Right. Okay. And then more and more, yeah, we're trying to get vinyl made and just found it was a really difficult experience. It was certainly not a very friendly one to somebody who wasn't a major label, like an independent artist. Right? So that makes it like, oh, hey, I'm going to do that. That looks great. <laughs> <laughs> right? Yeah. Well, I just, you know, I, I was, when I was working at Google, I just had to do this presentation. And it was really interesting because I was trying to show the magnitude of how many streams you need to make money in this yeah. era. And the infographic I showed said, you know, 100 vinyl records equals 368,000 Spotify streams equals wow. 2.5 million YouTube views. I mean, that's a t-shirt that's, right there, That's Jen. crazy. Right? <laughs> Market. Oh that's a t-shirt right there. <laughs> like I was giving that presentation and that slide and I was like, what in the world? So I started thinking more about vinyl and, you know, kept coming back to this idea of like, could there be room for another plant? Here in America, what would that look like? What would it be like for somebody like me who has not been in the vinyl community other than a you know as a casual collector yeah. to kind of try to build a factory and bring fresh eyes to it? And now I own a forklift. And <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, can I mean, you drive the forklift? I can, is the know, question. Every, every time I do, it's funny that it's always guys out at the FedEx truck. You know, they're always like, "Yes, young lady, should you be driving that?" I'm like, "Oh yeah, watch this." You know, <laughs> here's oh, my man. license. <laughs> yeah. I mean, you you should literally put a sticker on the back that says "Property of Karen" on the back of your forklift and be like, "Actually." Do you want me to bedazzle it too? Because I own this thing. Yeah, it's fun. When I go out in heels, especially, it's kind of just like, <laughs> extra, like you know, wink and nod at them. But yeah, so yeah, I, I certainly like 10 years ago, five years ago, had you told me I would own a vinyl record factory? <laughs> I've been like, what are you 
talking <laughs> about. And people thought I was nuts. I mean, I have luckily my family didn't. My friends, people who you know, whose opinion I really care about, but. Yeah. Lots of strangers had lots of ideas. I mean, I kept getting told over and over again, like, you're not going to get money for this. It was very definitive, too. People weren't like, hmm, that's an idea. They were just like, you're never going to raise money for this. You're never going to get it off the ground. You don't know what you're doing. It was so, like, just so many people trying to point me away from it. And so it makes me really proud when I come in here and see, you know, there's a full staff running here and yeah. all the records yeah. we can make. And uh, yeah. I love it. I didn't know I'd love manufacturing so much. It is so much fun. You know, I think... Most people would probably find a label or some other way to be involved with vinyl. So I think it's really awesome. And I'm excited to have you on here to talk about it because you went to like the beginning, you know, <laughs> you weren't just like, oh, I want to get into vinyl. You're like, I'm going to open a pressing plant. Like that's, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's awesome. <laughs> Had I known how much goes into it, uh, maybe would have rethought that. But uh, <laughs> at the time, naive me was like, oh, yeah, we can do this. And, you know, it's every day's a learning Every day is a new learning. So besides people looking at you sort of like you were crazy, what other challenges did you come up against? I mean, like, how did you even figure out, you know, these are the kind of presses I want? Um, so what was that journey like? At the time, there weren't really many options. I mean, one of the appeals of getting into vinyl manufacturing at the time was starting to see new machinery come online. You know, I had been told, mm -hmm. oh, it's just impossible to find these old machines. You'll have to you know, sell a kidney and, you know, go to a foreign country and, you know, do a deal in an alley to get a machine. Like that's the kind of mythology that was around the vinyl pressing machines. So when new machines started coming online, um, although they were more expensive, it than an old machine felt like a path forward on that. Right. Um, you know, but I think one of the biggest challenges that we had was there just aren't very many vinyl factories in the U.S. And certainly the bank that I worked with to finance this hadn't ever seen a factory build out before. And so a lot of our, <laughs> a lot of our comps that we use to figure out how much it would cost to build this and maintain it and run it were incorrect. Um, yeah. I learned the hard way, like, you know, double your costs and into 50% totally. less revenue <laughs> and don't trust, uh, don't trust what people tell you. And when it comes to, you know, throughput on machinery or the cost of electric or, you know, all of these things, it's like, I, I learned the hard way to like double check the numbers so yeah. that was really hard because it's extremely capital intensive to start a factory. I mean, you have to have a ton of money to, and luckily, I, you know, as a especially, I think this has played in my favor, being a woman owned business was able to get banks on board that saw what we were doing and realized it was a growing market and something they hadn't invested in before and was able to clear that hurdle. But I know that that hurdle exists for so many people. Um, and I was really lucky just to find good banking partners that would help me with that. What made you choose Austin, Karen? Because you were out in, in California in Silicon Valley. What what made you be like, hmm, Texas, that seems like a good idea. <laughs> you know, I had an Austin keychain on my key ring for like 10 years for no <laughs> reason. I don't have any family. Well, now I have family here, but I didn't at the time. Yeah. I just really liked it. I'd come for South by and just got yeah. like a good vibe from it. But when I totally. came up with the business plan and had my initial financing secured, I basically took my business plan to a couple different cities and to their economic development offices and said, mm -hmm. If I were to come here, build this, create jobs, what incentives would you give me? Like, basically, like, why, why, sell me on your town. Yeah. And Austin really just, every door felt like it was flinging open. They really wanted Gold Rush Vinyl to, to mm -hmm. live in Austin. It was a piece of, you know, music business that would boost a lot of the local music economy. Yeah. And Texas is just a really easy, compared to California, especially, easy yeah. state in America to do business in. They're very you know, low regulation, like just get to work, create jobs. And so we were able to get Gold Rush Vinyl up and running from the time we got permits to the first record off the press. It was two months, which what? is crazy. Money. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. That's bonkers. <laughs> you know, people that were trying to start a factory in California and it took them wow. two and a half years just to get through permitting. I mean, yeah, you know, Texas of course. Really was the right place for me for the speed I wanted to move at. And a, a place I felt like if I was going to plant my life somewhere that I'd be happy to be for a long time. That's yes. helpful. Yeah. Have okay. you guys been to Austin recently? I mean, in the past South Bys or anything? I've never, I've never been to Austin. It's always been on my uh, to-do list for sure. Um, I mean, working in live music for as long as I did, like my bosses were always going to South By and, and whatever. And I got the luxury of like doing their logistics and planning <laughs> some of their vacations, but uh 
never got to sneak myself into their suitcases and go experience it for myself. <laughs> but yeah, my sister lives there. So she is the um, creative director for Austin Monthly magazine. It's so, a beautiful magazine. I love that yeah. magazine so much. So Shout out to my sister. Your little family. Yeah, no <laughs> yeah, so we were supposed to actually come visit right before the pandemic. You and I were talking about that. So yeah, hopefully. we were going to do a women in vinyl kind of gathering too. So I'm, yeah. I'm excited for, I feel like so, so much of my energy right now is bottled up. I can't wait for <laughs> South by to come back next year. And for I'm starting to see live concerts, you know, being announced. I, I bought my first concert tickets yesterday oh. in 16 for, months. For what show? For Rustin Kelly's uh, tour. He's uh, cool. a national songwriter. Um, awesome. But buying it, I was like, I haven't bought a concert ticket in... Yeah, almost 16 months. Was yeah. it a hard ticket or did you still get it in your Apple wallet? And you're like, oh, oh. <laughs> <laughs> it's for, for, you know, I'm, I'm a nostalgic person. So I was yeah. like, maybe they'll give me one as a souvenir. Yeah, <laughs> I, I have a whole shoebox full of tickets. It's like one of my favorite things that I was glad that I tried to like always have a ticket stub from like all of the shows that we did when I worked in live, sh- in, in live stuff too. So. Me too. I have a whole closet in my house that is dedicated to my rock boxes is what I call them. It's all of them. Yep, memorabilia. <laughs> I'm a huge set list collector. Like on my wall right here are tons of set lists. I always wait around at the back at the sound engineer. Like, Can I get, you know, front of house? Can deck. I have that? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I've got, a, I got a couple of those too. Or I would just like walk on the deck and take it when I worked there. And I was like, yeah. <laughs> no keener kid. This is mine. <laughs> It'll probably be hard to get tickets again, too, once everything opens back up. I feel like trying to get your COVID vaccine, like all of us who are used to trying to get tickets to things, maybe it was like a benefit. We were <laughs> just looking and looking, trying to get the first appointment. <laughs> Honestly, that that was like my genius idea. I wish that like some government person would have asked me about my input for vaccination schedules because I was like, yo, all you need to do is get a bunch of the unworking live professionals because we're used to getting like 30,000 60,000 people into a stadium on a weekend or a festival on a weekend wristbanding them IDing them right you know like giving them lanyards and like oh (laughs) you're VIP okay you go over here oh and you're this you go over here backpack checking them we could have had like the entire U.S. vaccinated in one weekend (laughs) and like Canada maybe would have taken two yeah Yeah, no I know I was like man just Tell them there's a beer garden and you can have like all you could have your like age restrictions. Like, <laughs> oh, if you're 18 plus, you go to the blue tent. If you're 65 plus, you go to the red tent. Please show your wristband and like your laminate. Thanks. Like, <laughs> so true. Put everybody back to work. It's like, oh, oh, I just I was like, man, logistics. <laughs> Yo, that's my thing. Could have done it. But sadly, <laughs> No next, NGOs. Next, next, were, next, pandemic, yeah. <laughs> next pand- I'm yeah. Hey everybody, I'm ready. Hey, <laughs> call Robin. <laughs> yeah, now, now that we all have Info our at womeninvinyl.com. Yeah. <laughs> now that we all have our Bill Gates microchips. <laughs> hey, hey Bill, are you listening? Like, if we want to do this again, <laughs> I, I've got you covered. <laughs> oh, uh, oh well, I mean, speaking of uh, technology, <laughs> we'll come back yes. to to this. Um, how did working in corporate type settings help you in your current role and what you're doing now? Great question. Um, you know, I think I'm really good at figuring out systems that work and looking at, you know, best case and worst case scenarios. I mean, I, I'm, you know, a, a business geek. I went to business school twice. I liked it so much. So a lot of, uh, a lot of my Hopefully two different ones. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And, uh, wasn't repeating, you know, uh, <laughs> you know, a lot taste of my the team- rainbow, Karen taste the rainbow. <laughs> <laughs> you know, my team are all like really intellectually curious people is the word I used for it. Nobody on my team had worked in vinyl. We really just all like learning a lot. And I think from a corporate perspective, um, certainly it, it gave people confidence. I knew how to run a business, even though I'd never done it before. It was kind of like, oh, well, you have some credentials on your resume that's that give us confidence that you're not going to like, you know, hopefully blow this thing up and like <laughs> right. lose us all our money or anything <laughs> like that. Um, and, you know, we're a really small, lean team. So I think one thing I took away from my time in Silicon Valley, especially, is how to use software to your advantage. Like we do mm-hmm. so much behind the scenes with geeky 
code, you know, <laughs> soft, like custom software, things that we've built to make our lives a lot easier and make our customers experience better. I right. think that's one thing that, especially being like a younger plant owner that I always wanted to have in our DNA. And it's helped us to also attract young talent that, you know, grew up on mobile devices and think more about that instead of faxing in a order form <laughs> as some plants still will have you do. Fax. I had to fax something the other day and I was like, where do you even go to find a fax machine? <laughs> right. Inkos, I think. <laughs> Keeping the fax um, alive. Yeah, right. Um, I mean, you, you were saying that there was a lot of people that were kind of naysaying you at the beginning. I mean, and I feel like we all came from a little bit of that hurdle in all of our roles. But were there people that were like, besides your family, that were like, do this. This is a great idea. Oh, my God, do it yesterday. Like, do you want to shout those people out? Like, were there people that were like absolutely like helping you along in the process? Or were you kind of just like, no, nah, I'm going to do this and it, I'm just shut up. I'm going to do it. You know, I had a great group of friends in San Francisco and yeah. I, the, the hard part about leaving there was leaving that community. But I had people who were even like printing business cards for me to Aww. encourage me. You know, I looked at leaving corporate America for a long time and was really scared to do it um, for silly reasons in hindsight. But, you know, it, it is a big leap of faith to start your own company and leave something that's secure. And, yeah. you know, I had friends, I'm thinking my friend Jessica Henry is one of them who really uh, encouraged me and weren't pushy about it, but, you know, saw the potential in what I wanted to do and, and kept, kept me honest with what my dreams were. I also had a group of um, music industry folks in San Francisco. We, I, we would have weekly gatherings. It was so much fun. We'd always have dinner and just talk about live shows or how we could keep that music scene alive with everybody fleeing San Francisco. It was so expensive for musicians to live there. It still oh, is. Yeah. Right? No kidding. So that group of people were just really tremendous. Um, That's supporter. awesome. My friend AJ Magnuson uh, is coming to mind too. So shout out to him. Nice. Well, I love I love those people. I feel like we never really hear about those ones where it's like, everybody told me no. And then there's like the little person with the like teeny tiny little pennant that's like, no, you can do it. Yeah. <laughs> that's a great point, Robin. Yeah. Cause that, you know, I've been really lucky in my life. I have so many people who cheer me on and, and are cheerleaders for me. And um, that that's hugely important when you run a business, it's a very lonely thing to do. And totally. especially something of this scale, um, you know, I was just talking to one of my other you know, favorite friends and champions, Mina Choi, who's a fantastic musician and composer. And we were talking about just even when you're, you're down and out, you still got to put one foot in front of the other and march on, whether you're scared or facing really tough challenges, like you just have to keep going. And when I, when I get down on myself, you know, it's it's hard not to have a pity party sometimes, you know, but I have friends who just kind of pick me up and say, Hey, get back on your feet and, uh, yeah. and keep going. No, that's awesome. I mean, it's, it's, it's hard, especially being the leader, you know, and when you get bogged down and you're like, all of these people are depending on me. I mean, that's obvious, obviously opposite from like what I do. Cause it's just like one woman show, do, 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 do. <laughs> but the only person I get to let down is myself daily, but you have a whole entire crew. So, I mean, that's got to be like the weight of the world on your shoulders all of the time too. So, I mean, it's incredible that you've got that mindset where you're like, keep going, you know, you've got forward momentum, man. I mean, that's what I tell everybody all the time. It's just like, just keep going and you'll, you know, get through it. Don't, yeah. get, don't get bogged down. Exactly. And, you know, one That's thing awesome. I've learned is it's super important to set boundaries as an entrepreneur. Uh, you know, I, I have rules like I can't work from my apartment. I'm, once I get home, I'm I'm done. So if I have to do work, I go out to a coffee shop or I stay at the office. But, you know, trying not to let it bleed so much into my life that I don't have perspective. Um, right. You know, I make a point to exercise, you know, three to five times a week and tell my staff I'm leaving to go do that. And I think modeling that to them and saying, I care about my personal mental health and my you know, physical health, emotional health, that, you know, being loud about that helps to say, you know, I love what we do, but it's not as important as taking care of, of yourself and making sure that you can be as sharp as possible because the kinds of problems that get kind of tossed in our direction really do require you to be sharp all the time. 
Yeah. Well, yeah, that's a factory so job. Yeah, a factory job. No, like notwithstanding, like that can totally just physically beat a human into a pulp anyway. So. Oh yeah. I mean. Yeah, I mean, and especially in the challenges that we're facing right now. I mean, it's yeah. it's, it's you never know from day to day if you're gonna have PVC colors, if you're gonna, you know. Yeah. I, I do have this. My sister is an, a phenomenal entrepreneur herself, and she um, encouraged me when I started this to come up with what we call our um, our contingency plan of yes. every possible thing that can go wrong down to like Karen loses the mailbox key. Cause I am the only cop, <laughs> you know, the, I, I was joking with her. I was like, we didn't put like cardboard shortage on there. How was <laughs> ever known that that was going to happen, you know? All right. Yeah. And it's crazy. I'm sure Jen, you feel this way too, but like, there's no playbook for this era we're in. Like I call right. my advisors for advice and you know, how do I navigate a COVID supply chain issue? And they're like, I, I don't know. <laughs> I've never, right. I don't know how you deal with a, a staff member who got COVID, but wasn't in the factory. You know what I mean? It's just all these things that we're having to learn on the fly. Yeah. It, it's crazy. Yeah. I bet Google helped you be armed for those kind of situations too, though, because there was like so many balls to juggle with that and like undiscovered territory with going into the digital space that didn't really exist prior to those kind of moments that you were there. Like, yeah. You seem prime. You seem primed for all of this like ball juggling and paper yeah. like, spinning. I think too, like corporate, because I mean, that's where I come from too. Yeah. I think it sort of teaches you like organization and like to think through things in a different way mm -hmm. um, to be able to sort of think on your feet. Um, yeah, I don't know. I, I feel like a lot of that is actually really helpful um, in the current position that I'm in to sort of problem solve in, in that way. And you know, that's a great point. And, and one thing too, that I was reminded is if I made a mistake at Google, it wasn't going to send the company stock plummeting down, right? Like yeah. you, you, you have a little bit more room to make errors only because of the magnitude of that company right. and how big their scope is. So me making a mistake, yeah, it can hurt my team or hurt our product, but, but it wasn't the same as like, you know, in this company, which I, I steer the ship, if I mess something up, it could really take it down. So I do think you get practiced in quick decision making and, you know, improving your judgment ability in a place totally. like that with a bit of a safety net mm -hmm. compared to like being on your own. Yeah. yeah. I mean, you got to take big swings in, in things like this for sure. I mean, but there's obviously lots that have paid off with doing what you're doing at Gold Rush because you guys do some pretty special stuff there. Thank you. Yeah. The team, I'm just blown away by their creativity and their commitment to quality and things. And that comes from them. That's not me coming down on them and saying, you know, you got to care about this that comes straight from the press operators and from our packaging associates who will challenge me and say we could do this better and i'm really lucky as a boss that that's the kind of team we have that's yeah. great well and you guys like let's talk about the gender gap a little bit if you're comfortable doing okay. that um you have more than a 50 50 uh ratio at gold rush correct we do yeah which is really something I'm extremely proud of. I wish it was higher, but, um, but for, for our industry, it's yeah. amazing. And yeah. I, I spend a lot of time mentoring younger women. Um, our internship program is a great place for me to do that. Um, yeah. and, and trying to just be as realistic with the women on my staff as possible about what my experiences have been in, the, in business, let alone the music industry. Totally. Um, but it, it's incredible. And it reflects too. I mean, vinyl buyers, you know, are women too. It's not that you have a whole male dominated industry, you miss half of the perspective of why people are buying vinyl, who's buying vinyl, how to approach them and, you know, make it a friendly, you know, atmosphere for them. So it's nice that we have those differing perspectives. Yeah, that's awesome. What would you say? I mean, you know, people, I think, have this misconception that manufacturing and vinyl it, um, is sort of this it's a dream job. And I mean, it is in some instances, but it's still manufacturing. And so maybe you could talk about some of the misconceptions or things that people don't really realize about what we come up against day to day. Oh, man, this has been a good year for that because <laughs> <laughs> every I had one, one person just say like, thank you for the polite email, but like, it doesn't change that my records aren't in my hands and it's like I, believe me believe me i want your records out the door so i can take more <laughs> on. like i'm not sitting on them because i don't want them out the door you know yeah um, i'm I, just gonna hang on to these because i really like them yeah right <laughs> so, 
believe me, dudes, I really, and it's always dudes uh, that complain about it, but yeah, I want these out the door too. But yeah, um, yeah, I think one thing is we've all been so trained in an on-demand era to expect everything to just show up and you can click a button and (sighs) magically the Amazon drones like drop exactly (laughs) what you're looking for, right? Like we were trained to think that things just kind of appear without understanding the supply chain and how difficult it is to do that. Totally. Yeah. Push button, receive item. Boop, boop. Yeah. So, yeah, so I think people just don't think about that or realize that we have issues like if plastic is delayed because there aren't enough shipping containers to take it across the United States to where we yeah. need it or, yeah. um, you know, the world supply of lacquers just shrunk really overnight because of a fire or our paper sleeves are held up because, yeah, another fire in a warehouse. Like it's it, yeah. physical manufacturing, things can go wrong. And I think a misconception is that you know, we just magically like think up the spinal and it shows up. <laughs> right. so, you, or you, you know, have everything, you make every single piece. So why mm-hmm. don't you have all of it? Right exactly. There, right. Immediately. And that's a lot of the conversations we have with people is, you know, when they're disappointed about something, it's a lot of it's out of our control. Um, a lot of it's in our control too. And, and even that is, is mind boggling to me when you think about how many things can go wrong in a record pressing mm-hmm. between you're dealing with a lacquer, you're dealing with metal plates, you're dealing with plastic substrate, heat, you're dealing with steam. I mean, it's, it's an amazing cycle problem. times. Yeah. Oh, it's... Yeah. All the oh, things environmental can... factors as well. How is, <laughs> how is the heat in Austin? Is it oh. cold there? Oh, <laughs> did something cold happen there this year too? <laughs> yeah. Right. Oh my gosh. I, the snow apocalypse was just, uh, I, I, I had a full breakdown on the, the middle of the week when it started snowing again, like it had just started melting and then it started snowing again. And I just cried for a whole day. <laughs> yeah. I mean, collectively as Canada, we were like, what is happening out there? <laughs> right. Like, well, and you uh, know, like my sister at, at first when it started, I was like, well, you know how to drive in the snow, you know, like you're from up North. Like we know how to get around. And then both talking to you and her, it was like, well, the city just wasn't equipped at all. It wasn't like they, you know, put salt or litter down or anything. It was just like, they weren't ready. Oh, pipes, it was not. Pipes aren't insulated. Like you guys no. don't know how much stuff goes into our infrastructure up here to be able to habit to these weird spaces. Like yeah. you're, you're counting on everything oh. not freezing for half it's of the year. Wild. <laughs> I'm, I'm really proud of the team, Kate, Isaac, and Ian in particular on my team, weatherproofed the factory before. When it looked like it might snow, they went ahead and just drained all of our pipes out. Wow. Like Amazing. the last drop that we could you know, of water. So when we yeah. came back, we didn't have any pipes broken except a city water line pipe to our toilets you know so that's amazing that's yeah. the one thing that happened great <laughs> yeah, right. yeah yeah i mean how like how long were you guys shut down because of that karen we were shut down for a week and yeah. even if we'd been able to get in here the city of austin um mandated that all manufacturers stop operating and in fact i mean we're a small factory but you know big samsung semiconductor factory was forced to shut down that's a ton of work in progress inventory that's lost it was a huge yeah. huge economic um yeah issue for the city of austin but especially manufacturers um it, yeah it was, it was pretty wild and we're, you know but even then you're telling customers sorry we can't physically be in the factory to press your records right now because <laughs> we can't get there yeah like, right. what do you, mean you can't get there <laughs> well i'm not going to force my staff to go in on a snowstorm and press your record <laughs> <laughs> right but anyway. it is it's crazy yeah oh what were the what were the uh animals called that uh luke skywalker Got oh, in on no, uh, he cu- he cut the one open and he like buried into it on oh, Hoth. Yes. <laughs> I never remember what that one is called, but you know, like let me just saddle up one of those. Sorry, Star Wars geeks. I mean, it's not it's not May Fourth anymore, so get off of me. Um, you know that he like let me just like hop on one of those and I'll beetle down Tauntaun. to Gold Rush and I'll just huh? They were called Tauntauns. Tauntauns, yes. Thanks, Mitch, coming through. <laughs> with the trivia <laughs> mitch everybody mitch <laughs> you know like it's like weather stuff is is things that people don't understand i mean like i had a power outage the other day and i can't cut any records when there's any power mm-hmm. it's like, a very yeah it's a very physical thing you know that happens yeah. here and yeah you know, we have a facility where you know but during covid you have to be really careful who's coming in and make sure everyone stays safe the, yeah. You know, the funniest thing that happened to us all pandemic years, we had a raccoon infestation. <gasps> oh, my God. Babies. 
babies. <laughs> I know they were tiny. So we went into the oh. factory and, uh, you know, our morning shift crew looked on the floor and all of our pipe insulation was on the floor. We looked up and this terrified baby raccoon. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> us. Like I didn't mean to get stuck here, and, <laughs> you know, trapped it. And then in the middle of the night, mama back. must have came and rescued it out of the trap. And, uh, yeah, they came back again. So they were like, we're music raccoons. Damn it. <laughs> we're joking. We're going to write a children's book about Rocky raccoon that, you know, broke into the factory and wanted to press records. And that was, his dream. <laughs> I mean, I'll that be funny if that's that. what we no make. Uh, yeah. If that's what, you know, is the best seller is our factory book about the raccoon. So. Oh man, <laughs> you've got to do a merch line with a raccoon on it. We, we, uh, we, we do. I wish I had it here to show you, but yeah, we've been buying stuffed animal raccoons for uh, <laughs> clients that have babies and I sending it with a little gold rush t-shirt on it. So that's yeah. amazing. I mean, I don't have a baby, but I'll take one of those. For sure. <laughs> <laughs> Is the baby the, like the bar for entry? Cause I have a dog. Does that count? <laughs> <laughs> Jenna's cats. <laughs> and I'll send it back. Yeah. They're a little mascot now. Yes. <laughs> Oh man, there was a raccoon that greeted me just as I got home yesterday. It was the best day, best part of my day. He was like he sitting was on top cute. of this little trash pile. And I was like, look at him, sweet prince. And <laughs> my my dog couldn't even see him because he was like perched up a little too high because usually Parker loses his mind if he sees a raccoon. <laughs> and like, we never see them out west in, in Canada because I, I mean, I guess they don't have to come into the cities to eat. So they stay out in the woods, but... That was like one of the best parts of moving to Toronto was seeing all the trash pandas all the time. <laughs> trash pandas are fake band name at the factory. Oh, <laughs> this is I great. Mean, we, yeah, we're, we're the going whole other side hustle. We're going immediately. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, speaking of, I'm so curious about um, how uh, the lawyers for the Beatles found out about your uh other business venture, the Octopus Garden. <laughs> yeah. So when I was a kid, I, I was super creative and I, I, I have the best parents in the world. And one of the reasons they're so wonderful is they never, ever told me my dreams were silly. You know, I'd come to them with these business ideas or, you know, creative ideas. And they always were encouraging, even if it was nuts, they'd nod their head. Uh huh. Great. <laughs> um, but I had this idea as a kid for uh, an, like a hard rock cafe kind of Beatles chain restaurant called the Octopus's Garden. That's amazing. And I drew up a floor plan and came up with menu ideas like yes. bean Mr. Mustard pretzels and oh my god, it's amazing. <laughs> Last onion rings. I mean, I went pretty deep and my parents thought <laughs> it was really clever and, and explored getting it intellectually protected and instead uh-huh. got a cease and desist letter from the Beatles lawyers. That was the first of two times in my life that would happen to me with the Beatles, but um <laughs> I still th- I still think it's a good idea. So maybe their estates will see the value in it someday. And- <laughs> But yeah, I mean, the only do have you to- still have those as like trophies because <laughs> somewhere, yeah, my parents thought were so sweet and saved so much of my childhood. Laminate it and put it in a yeah. in a binder, and then we're gonna actuate this. <laughs> Clocks ticking, Ringo and Paul. Clocks ticking. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, b- besides the raccoons ripping all of your <laughs> insulation out, like you guys have been kind of innovative and leading the field in trying to be as energy efficient and environmentally friendly as possible. Can we talk about that? The, like those kind of parameters of the of the factory? Yeah, and I think you know when I started looking at this industry, I was really shocked at how much waste was acceptable. Like. Oh. Every- Every yeah. conference I'd go to or article I'd read, people kind of shrug and say how much vinyl they went through learning how to make records or how much they threw away on a weekly basis. And I was just like shocked as an outsider that that was an acceptable tolerance. And so yeah. from day one, really wanted the staff to be focused on that and how to reduce waste. And then, yeah. you know, in a city like Austin, which is, you know, wants to be much greener and has resources for that it's been actually a really good place for us to be the city itself has a number of programs that encourage entrepreneurs and small businesses to find waste like our scraps from the flash that comes off the records and to find creative uses for it so we've participated in um a citywide competition uh each year as a supplier and last year the two winners of that competition uh chose to use our scrap materials in their products so one makes uh, oh, cool. household pots for plants out oh, of cool. flash oh, yeah. and out of um 
you know, on like the ends of use makeup and things like that and puts that all together. And another is making iPhone cases with our plastics. Oh, wow. We yeah. upcycle our, our wasted records and turn them into art pieces like vinyl bouquets and bowls and things like that too, um, mm-hmm. and sell those to consumers. So I, it, part of why it was important, to, well, there are a couple of reasons it's important to me, but one is if you're looking at the future vi- vinyl buyers who are young kids, sustainability is very much on their mind, right? Yeah. And I can't anticipate a world where we're not going to get increased calls for visibility into the supply chain. People are going to want to know what's in their records, what they have in their hands, what's in their household. Right. Mm. And so for us, you know, we're far behind where we want to be in terms of like goals and dreams for sustainability, but the little things we've even been able to do with our factory design and how our boiler systems work and things really were with energy efficiency in mind. And I hope, you know, pushes the rest of the industry to think about that too. Yeah, have any other plants like reached out to you to ask the things that we're doing in those respects? You know, not really. We've had one or two groups that are thinking about starting factories reach out and we have yeah. to be protective, obviously, of our intellectual property. But there's there's just like little things that, you know, are kind of no brainers to me that um, that people can do, such as upcycling or finding other sources and making it known that we have waste material that people can put to use. Um, I wonder if that's maybe a category that we could suggest to the old making vinyl dudes for when we get back to having in-person soirees and conferences where we all get to share our ideas. We're like, hey, Mm -hmm. look at all these fun things that these guys did with their waste records. Mm -hmm. Hmm. Yeah, because we hate putting it in the trash. We don't have enough waste ourselves to regrind and put that back through the machines. It would be more energy. It would take more energy, manpower, and cost to do that than to just find other homes for it, which I think is partly why we started looking for other homes versus just chopping it up and putting it back through the machines. But yeah, right. for sure. We have some, looks like some pandemic and band type questions. So oh, yeah. um, lots of questions during this time. Uh, did you change any aspects of production as far as like minimums or um, how you were pressing things to sort of help uh, bands still be able to put out records when it was it's been so difficult yeah i mean i think the biggest thing that's changed for us is uh it's it's really frustrating to talk about is you know our turnaround time which was our kind of competitive advantage has mm-hmm. been destroyed pretty much well i'll say this it for independent artists it's right you see it is very long when i hear uh, what you know the labels are looking at you know not getting things on a press for 50 50 months you know you're we like okay well or 50 weeks excuse me uh oh, i was like wow yeah. four years that's yeah. some planning <laughs> right get going uh no it you know we're, we're at 16 weeks right now we used to be at six and so that's really made it difficult for us to be able to fulfill our promises to smaller bands that aren't thinking about planning for vinyl that far in advance and yeah. certainly you know needed it now like i understand when customers were upset with how long it was taking because they were living for the past year, independent musicians in particular have been living off of vinyl revenue. Mm -hmm. There are no shows, you know, what else? Nobody was putting out records to tour against. So vinyl and merch were critical. And so the team is, and I've been like really focused on trying to get those turn times back down to help independent artists get through this cash crunch. But, you know, a lot of that was supply chain issue for reasons I still quite don't understand, we also were the only manufacturer in the city of Austin that was forced to shut down during the, the initial shelter in place. Oh, like, crazy. If you went to the city website, it said like hospitals open, libraries closed, manufacturing open, vinyl record manufacturing closed. Weird. Except for you, Karen, <laughs> you're closed. <laughs> and we're the only ones here. So. <laughs> okay. Feel a little yeah. singled out there. <laughs> I feel attacked. I feel attacked. You're like, who do I have to buy a coffee for? Man. Did I forget wow. to get a parking ticket? I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Took you know the that? mayor's parking spot. <laughs> yeah, because we were able to stay open. We fell into the manufacturing category and we had, you know, enough of a warehouse that we were able to stay open through it all. Yeah, I mean, we have a big enough space. And actually, Jen, we used Furnace as a reference to say there's precedent for us to stay open. And yeah. Amazon in Dallas as well. And um, I don't understand that. But, you know, it put us behind schedule. And one of the hard things that happen when you turn a factory like ours off for that long, for three mm-hmm. weeks, and try to start it back up, it's like a grumpy teenager trying to get them out of bed. <laughs> you know, it's just... <laughs> 
it, one thing after another after another was breaking. And so I think the hardest part for me as a leader in this year has been watching best laid plans just go off the rails for reasons yeah. that are out of my control. It's taught me to, to let go a little bit more if that can be a positive from it. Um, you know, but now we're, we're starting to think about, okay, well, what can we do now? Live music's coming back. We took on some larger orders and decided, you know what, that's not really our sweet spot. So it's given us a chance to rethink who we are as a company, mm -hmm. the clients that we are best situated to serve and how to get back to that and stay focused. Yeah, honestly, I feel like we did that too. Like, you know, it really was a time for us to evaluate what our capacity looked like and who we were best able to work with um, now and moving forward. I think it was good for that. And it, and it was really hard at, at the, when vinyl tanked in April, all, all the plants kind of saw it dry up because it was just so much uncertainty. Right. Mm -hmm. It was really difficult not to take everything that was coming at you because you didn't know if that was, if work was going to flow or not. I mean, I... Yeah. I hate to say it, but I was like really scared for the vinyl industry because so much of what we do here is around tours, right? Musicians come to us because they need tour inventory ASAP. Yeah. You know, with tours gone, I was like, man, I don't know what this is going to look like for us. And so we, we started stepping outside of our, our, our lane, if you will, uh, of what we're good at and learned not to do that. And so it's been reaffirming, yeah, if nothing else to say, we know the clients we want to serve and what we're good at. And let's just refocus on that. So... And I'm curious now what's sort of going to happen. And I think it's good. And hopefully other plants did that too, to sort of find who their market is. Because, you know, if you have different people serving different markets, I think it's a better future for vinyl to survive. Because my concern was, well, now lead times are so long that what if people start thinking, well, now it's becoming too boutique again, or I have to wait too long, or it's too expensive because people are trying to get their stuff in. That what if it does lose some sort of, you know, the upward trajectory that we've been seeing because of that. And so that's been sort of something in the back of my mind that I'm like, you know, I hope it doesn't go in that direction that it becomes hard to get because everybody's waiting so long. Yeah, I share your concern there because if people shrug and go, oh, it's going to take too long, never mind, then right. that's going to move on to some other form of entertainment or I mean, that that's kind of been like a godsend for me, honestly, is like the turnaround times for plants is starting to give me a little bit of an edge where I'm like, well, you know, you don't have to get a lacquer cut and you don't have to get plated. I can just cut directly into your records. So you might pay a little bit extra, but you'll get re your records quicker. Generally. Right. And versus not having them to sell at all. And that's, and that's exactly it. Yeah. That right. was the problem I saw as a band manager when it was... It, it was either have vinyl or don't have vinyl. There's, yeah. And if you didn't right. have it, you only take that tour once and yeah. all the money that gets left on the table. So totally. we've even seen, Robin, we've seen like lots of clients moving into lathe cut and, and just doing shorter runs just to get, you know, half product. Product and appropriately pricing it for fans and saying, this is such a rare thing. You know, we're going to price it appropriately to make up for. Honestly, you know, that's, that's been the biggest, one of the biggest hurdles is like, I get asked probably 12 or 20 times a week about doing a hundred. And I'm like, you don't want to do a hundred with me. Trust me. Also, I don't want to do a hundred of your record, but like, <laughs> but it's a then, good stop gap for sure. I mean, if someone it, puts in a vinyl release and needs like 50 to yeah. promo, I mean, that's perfect. It's true. But I mean, the, the price point is like, you know, you're looking at like a 30 or 35 bucks a record for me to do it. If you get right. like jackets and all that kind of stuff. And they're like, wow, you know, if I got them pressed that they would, I could sell them for $25 and make a profit. I'm like, well, it takes a plant like 45 minutes to do a hundred and it takes me like 40 hours. So <laughs> sorry. <laughs> but like, yeah, I, I am a maniac and I am a workaholic, but like there are limits as to what the human body can do. My friends. <laughs> yeah. With, with that um, in mind, Karen, like, have you noticed like some trends or common requests from the people that you know, you have been taking orders from in the last year? The best trend is that vinyl sales are just explosive. You know, yeah. people are repeat clients where I know what they, what numbers they were doing previously are coming yeah. back more frequently with repress requests and That's with awesome. quantities. It's awesome to see that, especially for back catalog stuff. And we're, I'm not talking like, you know, legacy catalog stuff. This is bands that put records out in 2014 coming back for repressings of those titles okay. and at quantities that, are really encouraging. That's um, awesome. That's a great trend. You know, we used to do about 75% of our pressings were black. I would say mm -hmm. now it's maybe 25%. Like okay. it was a shift towards color and the kinds of crazy color combinations people are asking us for. 
I think that reflects that there's just a lot of vinyl in the market and trying to differentiate and, and make it worthwhile for a fan to buy it, buy it now. Right. And, or buy yeah. two of them, buy the black one and buy the, the wacky color one. Exactly. Mm-hmm. Collect them totally. all. Yeah. yeah. Okay. That, that's a trend I've been seeing a lot too. Yeah. Um, Gold Rush just uh, um, kind of came up with like a subscription um, service. Can you tell us a little bit more about that? Because that's, I mean, with the artists that you guys are working with, like it's a very alternative to like a, an alternative model to like the vinyl me please. And like um, the other ones that I can't remember. There's yeah, so there's many of them now, but there really are. <laughs> we uh, every summer our interns research the, the vinyl subscription market for clubs and they come back with like 10 or 15 more each summer. <laughs> yeah, I know it's bonkers. Yeah. For us, you know, we've been talking about doing a club for a while um, as a way, ultimately, like our goal as a company has nothing to do with vinyl. It's um, our mission is to help musicians make more money. For us, one way we thought we could do that is to create a a consumer demand for those records. So we get lucky. We get to hear great music before anyone else does. And sometimes something comes across our plate and we're like, wow, more people should hear this. Totally. Since the biggest kind of investment in vinyl is upfront cost and the setup by the time we've gotten on the press for us to run an extra 100, 200 records is not a big deal compared to starting the process at the beginning. Yeah. And so for us, when the pandemic hit is when we launched the Vinyl Club and it was in part to help musicians earn a little bit more money. Mm-hmm. Um, for us too, it was about you know diversifying where our revenue was coming from. So it wasn't all just manufacturing, but we start tiptoeing into consumer. Yeah. Um, and it's been really fun. I think it's a nice thing for us to be able to do too for clients that Totally. Our, our excellent clients is to say, hey, we'd love to write about how great your record is and put it in the hands of people. And because we're manufacturing them, you know, our costs allow us to do two records instead of one at the same price as the other vinyl clubs. So you might not know the artists we're sending you, but we hope you trust, you know, our, our reputation enough to take the recommendations we're giving and, and give it a try. So it's been it's been a fun experiment for us to see how that's received. Yeah, no, I, yeah, I that's love a cool that idea. It's, yeah. it's something that I'm kind of like kicking around in Lathe World too, where I'm like, oh, hey, I really like your band. Maybe I should just uh, make 10 more because I talk about it on the internet all the time. And <laughs> people are like, how do I buy that? And I'm like, well, you got to talk to the band. <laughs> so it, <laughs> like, it makes it a little bit easier to maybe have some on hand. So when we talked to our independent artist clients about what else we could be doing for them, that kind of came through loud and clear was like, help us put our music in the hands of more people totally because they're not musicians. And I know this from working with them. Very few of them have business at the front of their mind, right? That's why they're creative. That's why they're musicians. And they're very good. At, they're very good at music. Right. Right. But like yeah. understanding of the year. Right. Uh, as a reformed musician, I can tell you, I do not belong in the business space at all. I'm like, what am I doing? Why are you paying me money? This is weird. I don't know what to do with this. Yeah. <laughs> So we're, I mean, we, we know how to do that. And so for us, it was, you know, we were talking more and more about what we could do. Is it exposure? Is it helping you sell records? And it kind of felt like, well, let's try this and see if this works. And you know, if we can turn people on to new music and um, it's, it's been fun to do. It's been tied. I mean, because of supply chain delays and stuff, you know, we had a calendar of what we were going to put out and it, that's all gotten kind of thrown around. So our subscribers have been really patient with us, but um, it's really, really fun for us to, to do that every month. That's awesome. What's sort of the next step that you can share, obviously, with Gold Rush? Like, are you hoping to step into plating or expanding on the amount of presses you have? What's sort of your goals? Yeah, we are um, looking at an expansion. So one of the things that was, I mean, this already was a big swing at the fences, right? To go open a factory without having run a factory before. So (laughs) why stop there? (laughs) (laughs) Well, the way we built the factory, we had, we have space for six presses. We have two right now. Yeah. We already did all the work on the infrastructure side to allow for that. So when it comes time for expansion, we just have to drop a new machine and we don't have to do awesome. any construction or, you know, I've already paid for all of the infrastructure. So I'm glad the vinyl market is booming because now I won't look so silly for having done that. But yeah. so we're looking at expansion. Um, we've got a couple other tricks up our sleeve we can't talk about yet, but I will be back on a future podcast i'm sure (laughs) about that but oh yeah of course yeah it's been it's been fun to be able to dream again i think when i talked to our banks and advisors at the top of the pandemic last year the 
sound advice I got was keep your head down and just stay afloat. That's all you have to do this year. Like this is not the year for big dreaming. It is stay afloat, keep your people employed, and then we can start dreaming again. And I feel like we're there now. We're, we're, We're through the worst of it and the staff are excited for the future and, you know, making plans. And it feels good to be able to think about the future again and not have this kind of cloud hanging over us. Yeah. With the pandemic notwithstanding, is this venture living up to what you thought it was going to be when you were like, I'm going to start a record pressing plant. This is what I'm going to do. You know, it's funny. Every year I look back uh, at the original deck that I built, that I took into the bank and said, I want to start a factory to see how it holds up. Yeah. And um, I had no idea how much more fulfilling it would be than I thought to create jobs for people. I think that is absolutely the coolest part of, starting a business. I don't make nearly as much money as I did in corporate America, right? As a small business owner, but I would trade that in a heartbeat for the amount of like just energy and good feelings I get in this. work, And it's so much harder than I thought it would be just in the, you know, like I said, the contingency plan had lots of things on it. And then you find out, Oh my gosh, I need a couple more pages of things (laughs) that could go wrong. Um, but, uh, you know, it's, it's so much fun. And when you get to, especially like when we have local artists can pick up their records here, when you get to be a part of that process and watch them physically hold their record, something that freak out, it's so the best. much, right. Because digital yeah. it's not the same. It's not the same when you see it on Spotify. It's, this is a physical manifestation of so much work. It is absolutely rewarding to be a part of that. And that was the piece that I didn't have a big enough imagination for. Yeah, yeah, it's a it's a powerful thing hard. when you, when you hand over that that physical copy, like mm-hmm. even if you, I mean, for my land, when you do one and you give it away to the to the person, and they're like, oh, oh, and seeing God, people like thing. enjoy it, you know, uh, yeah. like consumers too. Do you have a record that you guys have done that you can talk about that you're super geeked about? Oh man, well I'll tell you one we did. This is a crazy story, and yeah. it's entirely Perfect. true. We, um, we pressed a vinyl record for Skittles, the candy. <laughs> um, so when you said taste the rainbow earlier, Rob. Yeah! <laughs> so we pressed, a, it was for their Super Bowl ad, which actually wasn't an ad. It was a um, musical on Broadway starring Michael C. Hall from Dexter. <gasps> and we had to do this record. It was like a three-day turnaround on this project. Man. And the record was the score of the musical. And then on the backside was ASMR of Michael C. Hall eating Skittles. <laughs> <laughs> it is the weirdest record we have done. We didn't know what we didn't know what That's was going to be on the record until we got the, the file. The so it doesn't stop there though, because so we finished this record and it's it's you know it looks beautiful. It was on blue sky blue vinyl. We send it off. Um, the person who was supposed to pick the records up, I guess, missed the UPS cutoff and that UPS was closed on a Saturday. They oh, needed shoot. the records for Sunday. Um, they called and said, can you press some more? Coincidentally, I was at the factory and a press operator was there with me. So we pressed some more. <laughs> um, they put me on a plane with two full suitcases of vinyl and oh I God. flew it to New York, <laughs> dropped it off, courier met me yes. at the airport and took it and that is the links that we will go to for a customer. <laughs> wow, that's amazing. I was on a first date that night, too, with someone, and I, I had to call him and say, this is really crazy. I have to fly vinyl records to New York City. We'll have to reschedule. <laughs> that's amazing. For Skittles. Uh, sorry, <laughs> sorry, Dexter needs me. I'll be back. This I'll is a back. true story. I'm not <laughs> trying to stand you up. That's the <laughs> best. <laughs> I mean, the, yeah. only, the only way it could have been cooler is if you're like, I need you to carry some vinyl records right. with me to New York, get on the plane, and right. we're going to have some awkward plane conversation. This is the oh, best first date ever. I <laughs> no, it was great. And that, that campaign, uh, the, the agency behind that was really wonderful, and they won a, a, Clio, a couple Clio awards for that. So that was fun to be a part of. That's probably the craziest record that I'm, I've geeked out on. Favorite color or effect that you guys do at, at Gold Rush right now? Ooh, the team have been doing just these really cool translucent mixes that that – just, I can't even describe it. They look incredible. But last week they made one that looked like a galaxy with had mm-hmm. glitter in it and this marbling effect. And 
it, it's just beautiful. Like yeah, because you guys had um, like kind of a contest on Instagram for a while that was, was like name this color or whatever for a while, right? Yeah, we were creating new color combinations. We're about to put yeah. a bunch up on our website. Um, awesome. Our our gallery has been in need of some work, but yeah, the team just come to me with like great ideas. And one thing I love about them too is that they they will sometimes look at what a color an artist or, or like a client shows. And then get the artwork and say, you know what? Actually, we think we could do something cooler. Do you want to show them a sample and see if they want nice. this instead? That's and the awesome. clients are like, oh my gosh, that's, I hadn't thought of that. Or I didn't know you could do that. And it's fun to, to show that we care that much to be able to match the artwork to the vinyl or you know, make these kind of crazy, wacky things happen. Yeah. yeah, those are my favorite kind of projects from the start where we can sort of talk about what their packaging is going to look like and what vinyl colors or effects might be cool with what they want to do. Yeah, mm -hmm. it's fun. Yeah. Now it is your time to gush about your socials and like tell us where we can find you. Um, tell everybody how they get with the Gold Rush. <laughs> we are Gold Rush Vinyl pretty much everywhere on the internet. And the yep. uh, best way to explore a project with us is to head to our website and set up a sales consultation call with Jonathan, who's amazing on our team here. And awesome. uh, we'll make your final dreams come true. Yes, you will. Yes. Yes, you will. Thank you so much. This was great. Thanks, Karen. Oh, yeah. I always love any excuse to talk to both of you. And thank you so much for all you do oh, yeah. for the women in vinyl community. It really is just phenomenal to see the kind of support that women are giving each other in this industry. And it, it's, yeah, it's just encouraged me so much to like continue thinking about how do we bring more people into what we do every day? Cause it's a dream job. Yeah. Thank it you. It really is. I mean, mm -hmm. and, it's uh, it's people like you taking big swings that are allowing more people to get into those spaces. So absolutely. Thanks for being bold, Mama. <laughs> My pleasure. Thanks, as always, to the Archival for our intro and outro music. Thanks to Liv Mueller for this incredible song. The Women in Vinyl Store is live now, too, at womeninvinyl.com backslash store. As always, join in the conversation on Instagram or send us a note at media at womeninvinyl.com. Please check out womeninvinyl.com for past episodes and the amazing archive of interviews, even with me, where I predicted the Apollo fire. No jokes. Uh, thanks so much, as always, to Black Circle Studios, Peluso Microphones, and myself, Red Spade Records. Don't forget to like, subscribe, and give us a review on your favorite podcast delivery method. You can also contribute to furthering our mission at patreon.com slash womeninvinyl where you'll find all of the B-sides, deep cuts, amazing extras, and help us start a not-for-profit to further the demystification, education, and infiltration of more women and non-binary identifying humans into the vinyl making space. Thanks for uh, joining us, everyone. This was uh, Karen Kelleher of Gold Rush Vinyl. Yay! <laughs> Take it away, Henry. <laughs> This episode has been brought to you by Women in Vinyl, Red Spade Records, and produced by Black Circle Studios. Thank you for listening. Please remember to subscribe. And you can always contact us directly by visiting www.womeninvinyl.com.